Welcome everyone, a new year, it's awesome, I love, um, I love new days, new mornings, new years where everything stretches out with opportunities and possibilities and new mercies and an opportunity to reset and so uh, today the title of my message is Time to Reset, uh, wanting to really encourage us all regarding the new year to align ourselves correctly and um, position ourselves for the new year. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you today that your mercy is on you every morning. How much more at the beginning of a year? We really thank you that your plans for us are for good. Thank you that you're a God who is good, a God we can trust. And so as we start this new year, we want to start it right. We want to start it relying on you, looking to you. And we pray today that your word would speak to our hearts and, um, yeah, each person who hears this message, that there would be something that you would challenge us and help us regarding in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, the message this morning is entitled Time to Reset. And I hope that all of you have had a great time of rest, a great time of holiday. For me, I really enjoyed it. Our family, we went away for a week or so and it was really awesome. And um, I love the morning, you know, especially when we're on holiday, I'm a morning person, the household is really quiet, my, most of my family sleeps really late, and I'm a natural early riser, so I wake up early, it's quiet, and the whole day stretches out before me with um, endless sort of possibilities, opportunities, have time to drink my coffee, read the word, a bit of prayer, a bit of reflection, maybe go for a, a walk, do something. And um, it's an opportunity to reset for the day. And so at the beginning of a year, we have that again. We have an opportunity to reset, to recalibrate. You know, during the, the holidays, my husband got us a smart exercise bike. And um, we're all excited about that. And um, I have climbed on it a few times since he got it. And I can say this about the bike. It's in need of calibration. What do I mean? The readings and measures that it gives to me in terms of my what out output, I don't think are accurate indications of reality. I mean, the watts that it's showing me are nice and inflated, but I don't fully believe it. And so it needs to be recalibrated so that the measure that it's giving me is an accurate indication of my reality and of my strength. Now, if we can't calibrate it, it's fine. I'll see how I've progressed as my um, as the, the, the what, outputs, what outputs increase. But what I'm saying is that in life, it's um, important that we measure ourselves with accurate indicators of reality. And so just how I want to do that with my bike, our bike, sorry, just how um, I could do that each morning in the holidays, resting, reflecting, resetting each day, we all have a chance to do it right now at the beginning of the year on a much, much grander scale. And it's an opportunity to recalibrate our lives, to hit the reset button. What happened in 2023 happened. What's happened before has happened. But we have a chance to realign ourselves. And, and that's so exciting. The opportunities and possibilities are endless in God. So wanting to encourage us regarding hitting that reset button and making sure that we're measuring things accurately in our lives and with the correct measures, just so we have an accurate indicator of reality. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9 to 10, it says, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. That's to God. Therefore we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And this is such a powerful scripture. See, a great way to make sure we are heading in the right direction and measuring our lives correctly is to view our lives from God's perspective or to view our lives from the perspective of, if I continue on the same traje traje trajectory that I'm on, in a number of years, when I stand before that judgment seat and my life on earth is over, how will I have fared? How will I measure up when I'm standing before God's throne alone without anything else, 
without my bank account, without my cars, without my kids, without my hubby, without the church, without anything else. When I'm standing before God's throne and other people's opinion does not matter, how will I fare? How will I fare? And so as I look at this, I see that Paul's ambition in 2 Corinthians was not to have a better house, to have better holidays, to have a better means of transport, to have a bigger bank account, to have better for qualifications and education. That, that wasn't necessarily his focus. I mean, there's nothing wrong with those ambitions. But as we look at our lives from heaven's perspective and from the perspective of having run our race on earth, May we share Paul's sentiments because all these things are worth nothing next to Christ. And at the end of our race on earth, to have gained all of these things, to have gained the approval of man, to have gained all sorts of crowns on earth and yet not have been pleasing to God, it won't be worth it. So may our goal be to please him. And this is a really great true north to put on our compass. So if we wanting to recalibrate our compass of life to true north, this is a great true north to calibrate our campus to. In fact, it is the only true north that we should calibrate our campus to, our lives being pleasing to God. And each one's life being pleasing to God may look differently, but the heart, attitude, the focus, the desire Will be very much the same. Now, as most of you know, I did a race, a very long race at the beginning of December, Desert Dash, 400 kilometers um, across the Namib Desert. And for a number of reasons, which I won't go into, and I don't know that I full, fully understand it, and um, a number of things happened, but it was a 24-hour race, and I missed the cutoff, and I came in 24 hours and 30 minutes. And yes, I'd been sick leading up to the race. Yes, I missed about five weeks of training just before the race, which was really not ideal. And yes, I went into the race with two cracked ribs, which I wasn't aware of at the time. I just knew I was in, in a lot of pain, but I, didn't, I hadn't had an x-ray. I did what I'd been told by the doctor. I strapped up, took painkillers, and off I went for the race. And I'm riding the race, and I'm getting the last six hours of the race. I'm in this race, and I'm really, really struggling and I'm really crying out to God. And yes, he sent help, but it didn't make it easier. It was really, really hard. And the one thing that he kept saying to me is, Trace, this race is not forever. Only I am forever. This race is not forever. Only I am forever. And for me, I, I, as I've been reflecting on the race and on what I believe God was uh, imparting to me and teaching me and showing me, I really have a strong sense of the fear of God regarding my life, that this race on earth that we have is not forever, only God is forever. And just like in my race, I missed the cutoff. So I had a, a race to run that I, and I needed to be finished the 400 Ks or the 397 kilometers in 24 hours. And I didn't finish what I needed to finish in the cutoff. I didn't make it. Yes, I finished but it was 30 minutes too late. And so as I look at my life, I don't want to run my race of life and not finish my race before my time is up. And so today I'm really wanting to share what I believe God is challenging me concerning, which is the fear of God, that we add the fear of God to our lives and really walk in the fear of God regarding our race of life. And we, we need to live our lives to please Him and with the understanding that we have a limited time on earth. You know, often, especially with young people, when you're younger, it feels like life will last forever. There's a sense of, of immortality that life will go on and on forever. And then as you have kids and your kids start growing up, you realize in actual fact what my parents and my grandparents and other older, more senior people around me have said is true. That time flies. That we don't have forever on earth. That um, our life is like a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And so we need to grow in the fear of God and seek to maximize um, our obedience on earth, living to please Him every day. Not, I will please Him one day when I'm old and decrepit and I can't do anything else. No, we must start now. 
walking in the fear of God, desiring to live our lives pleasing to him, obedient to him in the small things. And that's what I'm wanting to challenge us regarding today. Romans 11, 22 says, Therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God. Therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God. You see, our natural tendency in the body of Christ, in a large portion of the body of Christ today, is to look only at His kindness, to look only at His compassion, to look only at His mercy, to study only His grace. And these things are important. And yes, He is infinitely kind and compassionate. And we do need to study that, especially if we're discouraged. Yes, we do need to have a revelation of His grace, of His mercies and His forgiveness. We do. However, if we keep looking at that, to the exclusion of the severity of God, we can lose many things. And dare I say that we can lose our salvation. And I'm talking about if someone persists in habitual sin, disobeying God. We read about this in the New Testament. Those, And there's a list, and we've covered it before in our messages, a list of those habitual sins that ultimately, if we persist in these sins, will end up, we will lose the kingdom of God. And so we need to have an understanding of the kindness of God, yes, but also of the severity of God. We need to have an understanding of the kindness, mercy, compassion, grace of God. But to add to it, we also need to understand the fear of God. The grace of God is not the only thing mentioned in the New Testament. The New Testament also speaks of the reverence of God and the fear of God. And we need to understand both to be healthy. Often cults start when one verse is taken out of context Context, or people look at one portion of scripture and only look at that. It's important that we look at the whole counsel of scripture. Romans 11, 22 in the message says, make sure you stay alert to these qualities of gentle kindness and ruthless severity that exist side by side in God. Ruthless with the deadwood, gentle with the grafted shoot. But don't presume on his gentleness. The moment you become deadwood, you're out of there. You see, when we come to understand the grace of God from a perspective of understanding the reverence and the fear and the severity of God, we have a healthy outlook and a balanced outlook. When we come to understand the grace of God and we don't understand the fear of God, we remain in an immature state and our lives can end up being out of kilter. We need both. I was listening to a message um, on the fear of God recently and the particular gentleman who was teaching was saying the early Christians did not have as much doctrinal grounding as many of us have today and yet they didn't seem to struggle to the same degree as we see nowadays in terms of sin and in terms of some of the things that mature Christians struggle with. And he was just saying how a lot of these early Christians who came from a strong Jewish background would have grown up with an understanding of the severity of God, would have grown up with an understanding of the fear of God. You know, the Old Testament and the Old Testament, um, uh, 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 the, the, the Old Testament, a covenant really um, the people in the Old Testament like if you look at the Old Testament prophets they would have had such a revelation of the fear of God and this gentleman was talking just saying can you imagine Elijah clicking on pornography secretly no you can't imagine that can you imagine some of these Moses having having affairs or um, dealing um, uh, dishonestly with, with finances and, and cash? No, we can't. Why? Because there was an element of the fear of God that they had grown up with that was ingrained in them. And so with these early Christians, as they came to have an understanding of the grace of God, it was combined with their understanding of the fear of God. And that is a healthy space to be in. And Romans 6 verse 14 says, For sin will not have dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. And so there's an element of the law of the Old Testament, the fear of God. Yes, that's there. But now in the new covenant, it's not that Jesus or God had this 
complete turnaround and became a different person. He didn't remove the fear of God and now it's only grace. No, there's the fear of God and added to it is grace. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. It was a shadow and it's pointing to something. So we have grace and we're under grace now and it keeps us from sinning. It helps us to not sin. But there has to be an element of the fear of God there as well because many people have a revelation of the grace of God and continue in sin because they only focus on the grace of God. Of God, So we need a revelation of his grace to be holy and grace helps us to overcome our fallen nature and keeps us from falling. But we need to continually look both to the kindness and the severity of God to grow up healthy and balanced in him. And 2 Corinthians 7 teaches us that if we want to perfect holiness, we can do that only in the fear of God. So the fear of God is so important to cultivate in our lives. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. And so we need both. We need the revelation of his grace. Yes, but we also need a revelation of the fear of God. And so I'm wanting to speak that to us today regarding the fear of God, regarding helping us to recalibrate our lives, making sure we are looking at the complete counsel of God, making sure we are measuring ourselves and building our lives um, how we ought to be building our lives. You know, when we look at Jesus in Hebrews 5, verse 7 to 8, it says, who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to God who was able to save him from death, was heard because he was because of his godly fear. So Jesus feared the Lord. Jesus, the man on earth, feared God. And it says, verse 8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries because he wanted to be saved from death. Not physical death, that is not what this is talking about. Not the death of a martyr, but according to days, it's in the widest sense, he wanted to be saved from death comprising all the miseries arising from sin, as well as physical death as the loss of a life consecrated to God and blessed in him on earth to be followed by a wretchedness in hell. So Jesus wanted to be saved from darkness. He wanted to be saved from any sin. And he desired to walk in holiness as a man. He feared God. His prayers were heard because of his godly fear. And his prayers were to be saved from death, from sin. Interesting, his prayers weren't for more money or prosperity or success. He was heard for his godly fear. He He feared God and wanted to walk in complete obedience. Jesus is our great example. He possessed the fear of God. And Jesus suffered certain things and learned obedience through these things and grew. He wasn't on earth as a God. He was fully man. In Luke 2 verse 40, it says the child Jesus grew. He became strong and wise and God blessed him. So Jesus grew. He wasn't born an old man. He learned things. He wasn't, he wasn't born with all knowledge. He wasn't born with all wisdom. He grew in wisdom. And so, you know, we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so he, he grew in wisdom. So he must have grown in his knowledge of the fear of the Lord. May we grow in knowledge of the fear of the Lord. Amen. I want to share an open secret. It's not really a secret um, with you regarding the Lord. It's found in Psalm 25 verse 14. It says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. You want to know things from the spirit realm. You want to know secrets from God's heart. You want to walk with God. Cultivate the fear of God. In Psalm 103 verse 7 it says, He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. We made, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. You see, We can be satisfied on this earth by seeing God answer our prayers. He's making known his acts to us. We can pray and get the things that our hearts desires and we see God moving. But there's another level. 
that we step into when we walk in the fear of God. That is, that is the level of knowing His ways. That is the level of knowing His secrets, walking with Him. And Moses had some key regarding that. In Numbers 12, 6 to 7, it says, The Lord says, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make known, make myself known to him in a vision and speak to him in a dream. But not so with my servant Moses. He is entrusted and faithful in all my house. He is entrusted and faithful in all my house. Moses was faithful. What does that speak of? That speaks of the fear of the Lord. To be faithful requires absolute obedience, not partial obedience before man. That requires absolute obedience before God. That is the type of life that the Lord desires us to live. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, um, Samuel says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. So our obedience is the thing God is after. Our obedience, what do we need to walk in? To walk in obedience, we need to walk in the fear of God. And you know, as we look at Moses, we see Jesus, you know, Jesus grew in his fear of God. Jesus grew in wisdom. We see that Moses as well. Moses grew in his submission. Moses at the palace, um, Moses of the palace at 40, if the Lord had come to him and said, you know, build me a tabernacle like this and like this and like this, Moses possibly would have said to him, you know what, I think I know a better way to build this because Moses had seen all sorts of great things built in Egypt, pyramids and etc. So he possibly would have said, oh, I think I know a better way to do it, relied on his own wisdom and partial obedience happened there. You know, and the only ingredient that would have been missing in that tabernacle would have been the glory of God, you know. But Moses, at 80 years old, he's grown in submission and the fear of the Lord, walking and is faithful. He says, okay, I'll build what you want, how you want, period. No negotiations, no questions asked, no bargaining. And that is the place that I believe we need to come to. There is a place of complete dependence, of total surrender, of total um, compliance and immediate obedience of humility that comes with the fear of God along with wisdom you know and I think the problem with many of us today in Christendom is that we think in terms of all the big sins that we don't do we measure ourselves by that no well you know we are generally faithful in the things of God because and then we compare ourselves with unbelievers. We don't murder. Um, I don't murder. I don't commit adultery. I don't do this. Maybe I don't get drunk. I don't do this. So I think that's okay. I go to church on Sundays. I pay a tithe when I can. I'm doing okay. But And we honestly believe that's okay. But you know, I want to ask you a question. When we test the obedience of our children, is it tested in the big things? Or is it tested in the little things first? Is it that they didn't murder a teacher at school? Or is it, boys, come inside from playing soccer and help your mom. Boys, can you pack away your clothes, please? They're ironed, they're upstairs, pack them away today, please. Gents, can you tidy up your room? Is it tested in the big things or in the little things? It's tested in the little things. And so it is with God. You know, what are the little things that you and I both know we need to sort out or we need to do that God has been asking us to do? Maybe he's been asking us to do it for years and we still haven't done it, you know? And I'm not excluding myself from this particular message. Maybe it's small things that he's laid on our hearts and we're just procrastinating. Maybe we need to return the money we borrowed to make that relationship right to, to give that thing or to sow that amount of cash that God has been laying on our heart to do so. Maybe it's to give back that book that you borrowed. Maybe it's to run an errand for someone or to help that particular person. Maybe it's to change our schedule and our habits to include time with God on a daily basis, to do the things that God has asked us to do. Maybe it's to make sure that what I'm doing on a daily basis is actually going to take me where I know God wants to take me, that I'm living a lifestyle that is worthy 
of the calling that he's called me to. If he's called me to be a teacher and I'm never found in the word and I'm never found in prayer and I never spend time with him, then there's some element, there's something wrong there. I'm not living in the fear of God. If God has spoken to you concerning becoming something or doing something, start preparing even right now your daily routine. Let it be seen in our daily routines. Make goals to make sure to make sure it happens. We need to follow his instructions in the Bible. The little things to forgive, to not be embittered, to not take vengeance, to speak the truth in love, to speak out, or maybe it's to be quiet when we would usually say something. Maybe it's to come in the opposite spirit or to spend a season fasting or to take the high road in conflict and not vindicate self. Or maybe it's simply to do what he's asked us to do. And it's in the little things that we can often measure and determine our fear of God and our, and, our, and our level of obedience. It's in our daily routine. And the fear of God is so critical. The fear of God is a powerful thing that we need to have. Like I referred to earlier, Psalm 11, 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we want to live our lives and walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, if we want to live our lives faithfully before Him, we need to walk in wisdom and we need to have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a great way to ensure we're recalibrating and measuring our lives and our progress correctly. Now, I want us to spend some time looking at a man, the first man in the Bible, who received this validation from God, this certificate from God, being called one who fears God. The first man who, who was called a God-fearer, so to speak. And I want to look at a few lessons that we learn from his life um, and, and leave us with these thoughts as we enter into our new year. The first, okay, let me read, let me read the scripture first. Genesis 22 verse 1 to 22. Obviously, I'm talking about Abraham. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. Now, we'll get to the point a bit later in this particular portion of scripture where God calls him a man who fears God. But I want to take lessons from the build up to that point so that we can apply them to our lives. And the first thing that I see here is we got to listen to God. Listen to God. Abraham listened to God. Came to pass after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. First of all, he was listening. Second of all, he was quiet long enough to hear what God was saying. And third of all, he responded and said, here I am. And so I want to challenge us today. Do we drop everything when God speaks? Now, I'm guilty of this too, you know, thinking that I have God at my beck and call. Sometimes when I'm sleeping and I get woken, say 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the early hours of the morning and I'm tired and, and I can sense his presence and I... I just turn over and say to myself, okay, in the morning, Lord, I'll, I'll speak to you in the morning. And then when I wake up, that presence that I felt is not there anymore. I don't have God at my beck and call. You don't have God at your beck and call. You know, sometimes I'm in the word and he's speaking to me and I haven't turned off my phone and a call comes through um, and I take it and then I return to the word and it's silent. Not so easy to hear the revelation or to get more revelation. Sometimes I'm spending time with him and one of the boys calls me or something happens and I'm distracted and I move out of that place and I come back and there's silence. Isaiah 55 verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So there's an aspect of, yes, he's always present. His manifest presence is always there. But there's another presence I'm talking about that I think you know about. That presence when you can sense, okay, he's here. He's here. He wants to speak to me. Am I available to listen? I want to challenge us regarding listening. You know, when we come to pray, imagine 
Imagine I picked up the phone and I phoned my husband and I spoke to him for 30 minutes. Yeah, and then this, and then I love this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And I literally filled those 30 minutes with the sound of my own voice, hardly taking a breath, reaming off all of the stuff. And say, okay, okay, I'm going to go. Uh, bye. You know, that would cause a problem in my relationship with my husband. You know, um, that we would consider rude. If I constantly did that to you, you would consider it quite rude. And yet many times, many of us, when we come to spend our time of prayer with the Lord, we begin to talk and we just talk. Poof, one hour, two hours, our shopping list, boom, 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 boom. And sometimes, yes, we're getting something off our chest, but we don't listen to what God is saying. And it's so important. Prayer is meant to be a two-way communication. Prayer is meant to be, yes, I can be speaking, but I'm listening while I'm speaking. And if I got a pause, then I got a pause. You know, in our Zoom prayer meetings that we have, someone is always praying. But I can guarantee you when someone else is praying, I'm listening to the Lord as I'm listening to them and agreeing with them. We got to have that mentality as I'm praying. I often don't know what I'm going to pray. 10 points down, I pray something and then the Lord will show me something and then I pray something else and then he shows me something and then I pray something else. I'm praying from what he's saying to me. But we need to remember that sometimes we actually just need to be silent and we got to listen. We got to listen to him. Call, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You know, when we are in the presence of someone who is so much wiser than us, so much holier than us, we, we got to learn, we ought to learn to speak less and listen more. Speak less and listen more. I can learn a whole lot more from someone who is wiser than me by being silent and listening and asking questions than by just punctuating the silence with everything I know, which is a fraction of what I can learn from them. We need to be humble and ask questions and listen. Amen. The reality is the less we fear God, the less we listen to him. So we need to take a page out of Abraham's book and listen to God, be available to listen. The second thing that I'm wanting to challenge us regarding the fear of God and regarding our lifestyles as we enter this year is to display immediate obedience. We see in verse 2, the Lord says to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And arose and went to the place which God had told him. You know, from what I can see, God didn't tell Abraham when to go. And God often doesn't tell us when to do certain things. He just asks us to do them. And Abraham could have said, you know what, Lord, I have important things to do right now. In fact, my week is quite chock-a-block. If you ever look at my diary, it's already, you know, pre-populated. You know, maybe I'll do it next week. I'll just see maybe next month. Abraham didn't do that. No, Abraham woke up the next morning early and went. He didn't procrastinate. And sometimes we use spiritual language to justify our delayed obedience. Let's be honest. I'm praying about it, or I'm thinking about it, or I just need to get a bit of wisdom and counsel, you know. And what it often means is I don't feel like obeying right now. And we are sluggish in obedience. I'm not talking about when you're not sure if you've heard God and you're praying about it, or when you need to consult with your husband or your spouse. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we are sluggish in obedience and we use excuses to justify our sluggishness and lack of the fear of God. And the reality is we'll remain sluggish in our obedience all our lives unless we determine to choose immediate obedience. And often we need to choose immediate obedience before God has given us his instruction because Maybe his instruction doesn't feel good to the flesh. And then it's like oh, all sorts of excuses and justifications can well up in our hearts and our minds. But to say, you know what, I'm going to choose immediate obedience. Then the Lord says to you, okay, I want you to go on a this long fast. You already made the commitment to him and there's a fear of God. And so you'll do what he's asked you to do. Imagine waking up in eternity or imagine standing before that judgment seat of Christ and discovering that in 40 years of your Christian life, you accomplished what 
you should have accomplished in one year. And you missed a large portion of what God had for you because of your sluggish obedience. No, may that not be my portion. May that not be my portion. The third thing that I see here is I don't think Abraham was moved by ungodly family influences. It says, verse 2, take your son, your only son, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. So Abraham rose early, saddled his donkey, and went. Now, I don't see Abraham consulting with his extended family beforehand. I don't even know if he told Sarah what the Lord had required him to do. I don't know. And I'm not saying don't consult your spouse. I'm just saying that he obeyed without spending time consulting and explaining himself and bringing everyone on board and checking with a vast array of family members who were not godly, which is what we often see in the body of Christ today. We check with this uncle, that uncle, this grandfather, this, this, this person, this auntie, and they're not even Bible-believing Christians. And we don't go and check with our spiritual um, authorities or check in the word to see, okay, have I really heard God? Does, does this comply with, with biblical principles? Yes. Well, I need to do it. Even if my whole family doesn't understand, you know, he didn't check with ungodly family members. The fourth thing I see is he obeyed a hundred percent, even though it was inconvenient. We need to obey, obey a hundred percent, even if it's inconvenient. You know, today we live in a society of instant everything, of convenient everything. We have instant this, instant coffee. I don't like instant coffee, but we have instant coffee. We have fast foods, burgers, this, everything on demand immediately. And we like convenience. I like convenience. You know, I like efficiency. But we need to learn to obey even in its inconvenience to us. If I look here, Moriah, where the Lord had told Abraham to go. It was a three-day journey. Three days. Don't just read over it like three days. Oh, no. It was three days walking with a donkey. Three days. Very inconvenient, you know. Maybe Abraham could have tried to bargain with, in his heart saying, okay, you know what? Moriah is quite far. It's a three-day journey. Um, I think ultimately in principle, the Lord wants me to offer my son. So, you know what, there's actually a mountain half day's travel out back here and it's beautiful and I've had awesome times with the Lord there. You know what, I think I will obey God and I'll offer my son, but I'll just do it on the mountain of my choosing, you know. How often do we do that? Do we bargain with the instructions of God's, of God in our minds because it doesn't fall in with our wisdom, with our knowledge, with what we think is smart and wise, where it's inconvenient to us and it's uncomfortable but I don't see this verse 4 Genesis 22 verse 4 it says then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off so Abraham immediate obedience off he goes and he goes to the place that God has told him to go to so there were no shortcuts here you know how often does God ask us to do something whether it's a principle in his word or whether it's something specific he's spoken to us and we want to build it our way. We want to negotiate the details. We agree in principle, but we want to make it easier for ourselves. We want to paint a bit outside the lines. And God is a God of grace. So I'm sure you'll understand that it doesn't really work for me or for my family. Or it's not really, it's not really ideal for us right now. And we'll sort of get in the ballpark figure. No, Abraham, one who feared God, didn't do this. He did exactly what God asked of him. And he did it immediately. The fifth thing I want to challenge us regarding is that we live for the audience of one. We live for the audience of one. One day when we stand before his judgment seat, we're not going to be there with our boss, our this, our that, our children, our dogs, what other people have said, our crowns, our degrees, our medals, our achievements, we're not going to be there with all of those things. We're going to stand there before God and he's going to hold us to account for the things that he gave us to do. And so we got to live for an audience of one, even if we misunderstood. That's so important. Verse 5, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go and worship and come back to you. And so it says, so Abraham took the wood, laid it on Isaac, his son, took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went 
together. It's so interesting to me how obedience and the fear of God are so intertwined in the concept and the act of worship. You know, just as the certificate of being a fearer of God was awarded to Abraham, and it's the first time we see someone given this award by God in um, the Bible. In the same instance, it's the first time worship is mentioned in the Bible. And the significance of this is not lost on me. We can't separate true worship from a lifestyle of the fear of the Lord that manifests itself in obedience. You know, when Jesus taught that the Father is looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and truth, he didn't mean the Father is looking for those who play drums and keyboard and can sing beautifully. You know, how frustrated would he have been in in history with no drums and no keyboard? And why would Jesus have said that way back then? No, it's referring that. And that's all wonderful, by the way, playing keyboard, singing beautifully, playing instruments. That's fantastic. But that's not the main point. That's not what God is looking for. God, he's looking for something deeper. He's always looking for our heart. Um, When we live for him as an audience of one, things become clearer. The fear of the Lord brings about a dimension of living for the audience of one, of not fearing man or man's opinion, or else the fear of God is just so much bigger and louder than the fear of man's opinion, that the fear of man's opinion falls away as irrelevant. And you see, the more that we know God, the more that we understand the fear of God, the less we buddy-buddy with Him, you know, and the more we worship Him in the fear of God as Lord of our lives, the more we walk before Him and desire to walk before Him in complete obedience, the more we live our lives before Him as Lord not just Savior. We need both Lord and Savior. Amen. The more we live our lives before Him as Lord and the opinions of those around us really don't count as much. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. We will, each of us, appear before Him alone. You know, just on this topic of worship, And if we look at, if we want to look at the state of the body of Christ, I think many people and many of us don't understand worship from God's perspective and how linked it is to the fear of God and living our lives in complete obedience. And we see it as we look at many worship, so-called worship songs where it's very much God is my best friend, Jesus is my lover, um, or worse, so-called worship songs where none of the lyrics are really focused on worshiping God, but rather focused on me, focused on my soul needs being fulfilled and met, focused on God doing for me amazing and beautiful things. Now, those are great ministry songs, but that is not what worship is about. And maybe they're written by great musicians or people who have musical ability who are not necessarily exhibiting an understanding of worship and the fear of God. And so all of us who run to these songs and love singing these songs, when we, when that is the full meditation of our heart and our time with God, it's basically showing that we too don't have an understanding of the fear of God and worship. And so we placate each other in the body of Christ and our ignorance and in our immaturity and in our lack of the fear of God. I see that the first time worship is mentioned in the Bible that Abraham left his servants and went up alone with his son in an act of obedience in the fear of the Lord. You see, true worship is often seen in those moments of aloneness when no one else is looking and God requires obedience. That is where it's found. When we're walking in the fear of God, then there is true worship. You see, fear of God is so critical to to our walk with him. And the Bible says that God desires obedience above sacrifice. So when I'm not living a life that exhibits the fear of God and I'm continual, continually sinning and not listening to what God is showing me to do. When I show up on Sunday and I say I'm worshiping God in a worship service and I look incredibly spiritual from God's perspective, you ain't worshiping God. 
And so we got to live our lives with God's perspective and recalibrate everything so that we walking in the fear of God, that it's important, the fear of God. Yes, there's the grace of God, but we don't toss out the fear of God and our understanding of the grace of God, but we add the grace of God to the fear of God. And that's a healthy perspective to us. If all we think there is to worship is singing and enjoying his presence, we've missed something. Worship is connected to the fear of God. Our lives, living our lives as acts of worship have got to, has got to come out of a fear of God, you know. Number six, the sixth thing I see from Abram is give everything to God because it's his anyway. Verse 7 of Genesis 22, Isaac spoke to Abram and said, My father, Abram said, Here I am. And he said, Look, there's the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? And Abram said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb. And the two of them went together and they came to the place which God had told him. And Abram built an altar and placed the wood in order, bound his son and laid him on the altar. And Abram stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called to him and said, Abram, Abram. And Abram said, Here I am. And the Lord said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. You see, the test is often found in whether we, we will obey God or not. That's where we see whether we truly fear him. That's where we see where we truly walking in a life of worship. He says, now I know that you fear God. There's God's certificate, God's award to Abraham. You're a fearer of God. Now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. You see, to Abraham, his son was everything. His son was everything. His son encapsulated the promise and everything that he'd hoped for from God. His son was his, his heart's passion and joy. His son was everything. But Abraham understood that everything he had was God's anyway. He understood that God had given him Isaac and that he could take him away and he could give him something right back. So Abraham understood to give and to offer to God what he'd requested. He was giving to God what God owned anyway. You know, some people say, well, Abraham gave to Melchizedek 10%, so we give 10% tithes. No, if I look here, Abraham understood that everything was God's and he feared God and he gave everything to God. I'm not meaning that we take everything and put it in the offering basket. No, I mean, there's a revelation here that all we have and all we are and, and, and all that belongs to us actually belongs to God and we stewards. And so when I give, I give to God what he's asked for because he owns it anyway. And I'm a steward, whether it's finances, whether it's time, whether it's talent, whether, whatever it is, it's a deep heart attitude that comes from understanding God as a Lord and all I am and all I have belongs to him. And there's a fear and reverence toward God that he can do with me and mine as he desires. Amen. Verse 13, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there was a ram. Abraham took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said in this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And then the angel of the Lord called to Abram and said, Because you've done this thing and not withheld your son, blessing I will bless you, multiply I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and so on and so forth. And your seed, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. The test of the Lord, the test of obedience is often past alone it's when we are living our lives in the fear of God and often true worship is seen when we're alone when no one else is watching whether our hearts are really hearts of worship and all of these things require us to walk in the fear of the Lord and so as we enter our as we enter 2024 we have this chance right now at the beginning of a year on this grand scale to recalibrate our lives, to hit the reset button, to make sure that our compass points north to where true north really is, 
that it's not, we're not being misled by the wrong measures, by the wrong values, that we have an accurate indication of reality. For we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll give an account before the Lord by ourselves. And so I want to encourage us at the beginning of the year to determine in our hearts to walk in the fear of God, to grow in our understanding of the fear of God, to listen to God, to make ourselves available to listen and to hear Him, to determine to listen to Him more than we tell Him. I want to challenge us to display immediate obedience this year. If God has spoken to us concerning things He desires us to do, to do it immediately. I want to challenge us to be unmoved by ungodly family influences or ungodly influences. I want to challenge us to obey 100%, even if it's inconvenient, to live our lives this year and from here on out, and from here on out for the audience of one and to give everything to God because it's His anyway. And in so doing these things to be those true worshipers that He's seeking. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we really thank you for the richness of your word. And today we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us where we've taken your grace for granted and where we haven't walked in the fear of the Lord. And we pray that you would lead us and teach us and help us to grow in this revelation of the fear of the Lord, that you would help us to grow in wisdom as we practically live our lives. We ask that you would help us, Lord God, to, to listen to you, to hear what you're saying, to display immediate obedience, to be unmoved by ungodly influences, to obey 100%, even if it's inconvenient, to live our lives before you as an audience of one and to give everything to you, whatever you're asking, because it all belongs to you in the first place, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.